Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, more on ethanol. What's moving that market? What's not? Plus, California's Prop 12 takes a momentary back seat, but not for long. And what happens when it does take effect? Our Southern Gardening segment fits right in. Gary says it sometimes pays to be radical. And in our feature, before we get too far into 2022, a look back at 2021. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us once again here on Farm Week. This week, yet another follow-up in the biofuels world, Ford stopped taking orders for its new Maverick pickup and reopened reservations for its electric F-150 pickup. Peter Tubbs reports on these and other economic headwinds for the ethanol industry. The shift of the transportation sector from internal combustion engines to electrically driven vehicles was a popular topic at the Iowa Renewable Fuels Conference in Des Moines this week. Seth Meyer is USDA's chief economist. And so what we have is a very flat, under current assumptions, a really flat use for ethanol going forward. I think there are opportunities. I think there are definitely opportunities. Some of those opportunities have been talked about here at this forum. You know, you talk about E15 changing the math. You talk about sustainable aviation fuel changing the math. So I think that there are alternatives. While the focus for the event was about increasing the marketplace for renewable fuels, there were discussions on how inflation expected interest rate hikes and spikes in input costs are influencing the general condition of the rural economy. Right now you got lumber prices rising at unbelievable pace. Fertilizer prices for the farmers out there. The input costs that farmers are facing, and that's particularly important in this part of the country, that's squeezing their margins because they have little control over the price they get for their corn, their soybean, their wheat. Goss, who authors the monthly Economic Snapshots Emid American Index and Rural Main Street Index from his desk at Creighton University, is finding optimism for the future among rural bankers. Now, our surveys of bank CEOs in rural areas indicate that the, we're still seeing growth. Unfortunately, the growth is probably not enough to compensate for this inflationary pressures, but it's still better off than some states. Meyer sees high commodity prices as a way of helping to offset tapering government payments to producers for losses due to the trade war with China and supply chain chaos from the COVID-19 pandemic. Is a dollar from the government and a dollar from the marketplace spend the same, but they feel different in your wallet. Meanwhile, in the pork industry, continuing discussions related to the headwinds facing those producers, including California's hotly debated Proposition 12. At this year's Iowa Pork Congress in Des Moines, which closed just days ago, con uh, producers concerned about that and more. Here with that story, Farm Week's Jonah Holland. Jonah? Mike, there's no question that many issues, including Prop 12, are uppermost in the minds of pork producers. Last week, a California judge stayed enforcement of Prop 12 for six months, citing so-called inherent flaws in the measure, including how it should be implemented. Discussed at this year's event, a wide range of topics from farm security to profitability. Producers reviewed recent developments with California's controversial Prop 12, a judge's ruling delayed implementation for 180 days to allow officials time to iron out the fine details. The act mandates minimum space requirements for hog, hen, and veal confinement operations. I mean, I think one of the challenges is just the uncertainty surrounding it. And you know, do you make decisions to comply with California so you have access to their market or not? And I think that headache of that uncertainty, uh, despite the fact that it you know, maybe was a bit of relief to some of the industry to have that pushed off a bit, it doesn't resolve any of the uncertainty. So I think we're still going to have to live with that for a little bit. Producers are concerned about Prop 12's impact on the nation's pork supply chain and prices paid by consumers. And what we found is that there's a, a pretty big drop in uh, um, potential drop in consumption as a result of some of those folks that are not as economically well off 
Producers also discussed disease prevention, with an emphasis on African swine fever and last year's outbreak in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. What we've been doing is really providing resources to USDA and, and other experts that are trying to study the issue and, and really knowing how the disease works and how it travels. So, Prop 12 and ASF, two of the biggest worries for producers. The USDA recently committed $500 million in additional funding to help the nation's 60,000 pork producers combat the disease. Meanwhile, Prop 12 will continue to fight its way through the court system. Mike? Thanks, Jonah. Producers market more than 115 million hogs every year. On average, these animals provide gross revenues of about $20 billion, supporting more than half a million American jobs. And speaking of the meat industry, the fight to level the playing field between producers and packers continues with the president entering the fray. As producers continue looking for marketing options on places to take their animals, the Biden administration announced a plan to widen those options beyond the big four packers. John Torpy reports. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Capitalism without competition isn't capitalism, it's exploitation. This week, President Joe Biden announced the allocation of $1 billion to advance expansion of small and medium-sized meat packers and processors. Strengthening competition is good for all of us. Farmers and ranchers deserve a fair shake. American families facing high prices at grocery stores deserve a fair price to put food on the table. With funds from the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, USDA plans to bolster the competitiveness of small and medium-sized meat processors by assisting with equipment and infrastructure upgrades. Administration officials also seek rule changes to the Packards and Stockyards Act to increase price transparency. USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack has made repeated trips to Capitol Hill for hearings on the state of the meat processing industry. Beef, pork, and poultry producers have continuously raised concerns about financial disparities between farmers and ranchers and the top four meat processors, Cargill, Tyson, JBS, and National Beef Processing. According to the President's National Economic Council, meat packers saw record profits in 2021, as their margins have risen 50 percent and net profits 300 percent since the beginning of the pandemic. On the lighter side, when you do your own gardening, there are times when it pays to be a radical. In Southern Gardening Today, Gary calls for the twin virtues of boldness and courage when it comes to radical renewal pruning. Here's Gary. Pruning is radical and not for the faint of heart, but it's an effective method of salvaging an overgrown shrub when compared to removing and replacing the plant. Sometimes a landscape shrub overgrows its location. Renewal pruning is an option to help rejuvenate a severely overgrown bush. The optimal time of year to renovate a shrub is before new growth starts in the spring. So for Mississippi, I recommend such severe pruning be performed in the January-February time frame. The pruning tools will vary depending on the diameter of the branches and limbs. While a small hand clipper could easily cut back branches up to three quarters of an inch, larger branches up to one and three quarters will require loppers. Pruning saws with their razor sharp teeth work well on larger branches and for the main trunks. Let me demonstrate on this overgrown holly, which is very tolerant of severe renovation pruning. Ultimately, I'm going to radically prune this holly back to about 24 inches, and when finished, it might remind you of a short coat rack. Yes! Don't worry about the fresh cuts. Research clearly shows that leaving them open to heal is the best method for a speedy recovery and flush of new spring growth. This pruning job may look extreme and severe, but trust me, 
This holly will regrow into a more size appropriate specimen for this landscape. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature before we get too far into 2022, a look back at the tumultuous year we've just come through. Started with a bang and kept right on plowing forward. Energy is certainly on the radar, along with COVID, of course, and all of the impact it had on the supply chain, meat processing, and virtually everything else in the economy. Meatpacking is still an issue and likely to be for a while, along with a short supply of truckers. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jonah Holland, and I'm a communication major at Mississippi State University. As a college student, I'm young and generally pretty healthy. I try to take care of myself, but the coronavirus, especially the Delta variant, doesn't care about that. It's putting both young and healthy people alike in the hospital, not just older, sicker people. The best defense we have is the COVID-19 vaccine. And the first one has just received full approval from the FDA. Billions of people around the world have received it, and the science shows it is safe and effective. Right now, in Mississippi, more than 85% of people in the hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. 85%, think about that. So don't wait, talk to your doctor or pharmacist, get the facts you need and get the vaccine. You'll be a hero. As extension professionals, we have a creed, words that mean a lot to us. It says we believe in people's right to make their own decisions, and we do. It also says we believe that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of others. That's why we want to make sure that you have the facts about the COVID vaccine. Fact, the Delta variant is dangerous. It's more than twice as contagious as the original coronavirus. Fact. In Mississippi, more than 85% of the deaths from COVID-19 have been among unvaccinated people. The vaccine is not 100% effective at preventing all infection. No vaccines are, but it can save your life. And that, my friends, is a fact. So get the facts you need and get the vaccine. You'll be a hero! Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through extension education. We care about their success and yours. Extending knowledge, changing lives. The MSU Extension Service. Time for this week's market report. Once again, Zach Ashmore in studio with this week's numbers and his usual deeper dive. Zach? Thanks, Mike. We're still seeing a general trend upwards for row crops while livestock and lumber down, the latter getting it more. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, lumber down about $119, continuing a two-week trend. I inadvertently reported lumber up last week when it was actually down. Thanks to viewer Steve from Oregon for letting us know. Last week's biggest gain, soybeans up nearly 60 cents, followed by corn at nearly 20 cents. A pretty impressive rise. We'll get into why in a moment. So. Row crops still shooting up, especially corn and soy, as we said, but that leads to the question, why? Well, several factors, namely the time of the year, stocks, and weather, the normal, as it were. Market analyst Elaine Cub breaks it down for us and gives us some advice on what's to come. Honestly, you can think of some bearish things that happened in South America. The South American weather story was sort of bearish fundamentally for both corn and soybeans, and yet prices did keep going up. And I think it's related just the overall demand or um, aspiration to get it long in commodities as an inflation hedge. I think these prices are well supported and I don't see major danger in the very near future of them falling apart. Um, especially the South American, you, you were worried about getting more rain there and things really turning bearish, but the Brazilian second crop of corn, uh, the planting and the, and the weather there really hasn't improved it very much. It's sort of beyond hope in some cases. So all of these bearish news weren't even able to bring prices down. So I don't know, I think you just kind of let it go and see what happens. 
the basis actually is in danger of, of weakening just seasonally and also from a transportation um, aspect. There's been the colder weather and we did see some poor rail service metrics and so we did sort to see some transportation problems, slow service, and that does tend to push back against uh, farm origin prices through the mechanism of weaker basis. There's definitely profit. You can lock in your input costs today, assume that they will be available in the spring and make you know a dollar and a half, two dollars in profit even. And looking at um, the University of Nebraska put out their crop budgets, and even considering the cost, the extra fuel costs, which is higher, about you know tw twice as much as it was last year, even with the center pivot irrigation, you're looking at maybe for corn uh, an extra 50 cents per bushel on your production cost of production. So that sounds like a lot, but when you consider how much higher the new crop futures prices are, there is profit in there. I don't think necessarily that the markets need to even do anything to make anybody plant corn or, you know, there's some narrative that people would avoid corn because of the higher fertilizer costs, it's still more profitable to grow corn. They are still underpriced in relation to corn, in relation to canola, in relation to palm oil, in relation to basically any other of their comparative markets. You might even say they're still underpriced, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily heading to $16. You want to you wanna sell these prices before everything collapses in March or April, but I don't think you necessarily want to be pulling the trigger today because there's still the chance for things to churn a little bit higher. And not only that, but think of 2022 and you don't have quite as high soybean prices and 2023 even, 1240. This La Nina story that has supported um, not only some dryness in North America, but certainly the dryness in South America this winter has been supported by the La Nina phenomenon, which is 67% likely to continue for the next couple of months but then we'll probably neutralize. That's the, the latest thinking from the climatologists. So it's not forever. We, we are not gonna have these bullish uh, support forever. Moving on to cattle, prices trending downward as we've said, but things may turn around. Once again, Elaine Cub gives us the details. Live cattle market sort of is what it is. Didn't have great exports, but the, the cash cattle stayed pretty steady this week, 137 for Southern Live dress deals. So, and that's pretty much right in line with where the futures are. And I think that's kind of stuck there when you look at the, the choice box beef sort of topping out here and staying fairly neutral. There's only so much that consumers can ultimately pay for that beef. And I think we're sort of finding that, that neutral level. From the week, you sort of look at the chart and it looks scary. But as I mentioned, the cash cattle business, the actual profit margins that are there, they continue to be, the same fundamentals continue to be in place. So what's really interesting is on Monday, the USDA is gonna put out their January 1st cattle inventory report, and then we will finally get some hard numbers on not just the cattle on feed that are in the 1,000 plus head feedlots, but also sort of the backyard feeders, the people who are more likely to bulk at the $6 corn, who are more likely to be feeding these feeders when the corn is cheaper, when it's $3 and you're trying to put some value added in there. So I think that the market will finally see some hard numbers to demonstrate, as you mentioned, the supply tightening that has happened in the feeder cattle market and will continue to happen in 2022 and 2023. The breeding herd just isn't there anymore. But you look past April, you're still seeing feeder cattle prices at 165 or higher. It's just sort of a seasonal thing here of, of when the buyers are going to get out there and, and want to see those calves coming, coming onto the market. That USDA report Elaine mentioned did indeed drop Monday, and here's what it said. All cattle and calves in the U.S. as of January 1, 2022, down 2% compared to last year. Cattle and calves on feed in the U.S. down 3%, while 2021 calf crop in the U.S. down 1%. According to MSU Livestock Economist Josh Maples, referencing the report, calf crops are getting smaller, which is bullish for cattle prices. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Mike? Thanks, Zach. Two years into the pandemic, it's easy to look back over 2021 with the feeling that not much improved over 2020. Before we get too much further into year three, here's a look back over the tumultuous 12 months of last year, thanks to Peter Tubbs of our news partner, Market to Market. While the political year opened with the chaos of an insurrection and attempted coup, the COVID-19 pandemic cast a long shadow over the nation's politics and economy. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. Thank President. You. On January 20th, former Vice President Joe Biden of Delaware was sworn in as the 46th President of the United States. One of his first executive orders withdrew the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline which would have added capacity to pipelines delivering Canadian and U.S. crude to distribution points in the Gulf of Mexico. 
Environmental groups had argued that the pipeline crossed environmentally sensitive areas and wasn't needed in a petroleum market that has struggled with overproduction. President Biden also issued orders ending new construction of the Mexican border wall, a focal point of the Trump administration. The rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine, which began in December of 2020, accelerated in the spring of 2021. But vaccinations quickly became political. Just over 60 percent of Americans have received two doses of a vaccine. An economy that rapidly slowed when the pandemic struck in 2020 reopened in fits and starts. Workers whose jobs disappeared in 2020 were cautious to return to the workforce for both economic and medical reasons. Employers struggled to coerce staff back into the labor market and resorted to raising wages to fill jobs. Companies that saw revenues and profits drop in 2020 reported record earnings in 2021 as pent-up demand fueled strong sales. The high demand for everything from cars to cuts of beef drove inflation to levels unseen in 40 years. The cost of housing, used cars, and fuel led the spike. Oil prices doubled from pandemic lows, but without the production and shipping problems that plagued the rest of the economy. When the big four can have uh, all of that captive supply so they do not have to go out and compete for those cattle, then they can push down the prices. Meat packers saw record profits in 2021 as their margins have risen 50 percent and net profits 300 percent since the beginning of the pandemic. Tyson saw record profits in 2021 despite shipping fewer pounds of meat compared to 2020. Live cattle prices are up roughly 10 percent since the beginning of the pandemic. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. Secretary. Tom Vilsack returned to the USDA as Secretary of Agriculture. Vilsack, who served eight years under President Obama, targeted the meat industry during his confirmation hearing. I think we need alternative processing opportunities. Why? Not just from the competitive standpoint, but also from a resilience standpoint. We found that when one or two uh, processing facilities uh, shut down during COVID, that it, just, it, it, it created havoc in the market. We can't have that. Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa introduced a bill in May to mandate that beef slaughterhouses purchase half of their animals on the cash market. According to cattle market researchers, slaughterhouses currently purchase less than 30 percent of their cattle supply on the cash market and are approaching cash purchase rates seen in the poultry and pork markets. This is the 11th time Senator Grassley has proposed this bill during his tenure. In September, the USDA created a $500 million pool to start and expand small meat packers in the U.S. The assumption is that more smaller slaughterhouses would lessen the pricing power of the four largest meat processors. The meat packing industry opposes government involvement in their market. Moving food and goods from the factory to the retailer was also a struggle in 2021. I believe our economist looks at uh, the number of, of 80,000 short after the pandemic. A shortage of truck drivers was often cited as one reason for supply shortages that spiked the cost of goods. Federal trucking rules were loosened during 2020 to facilitate more efficient movement of truck traffic. And the industry hopes those rules can remain more liberal. But while recruiting the next generation of drivers to the industry is a challenge, the shortage cited by the industry is only a 2 percent gap. A crush of goods trying to enter U.S. ports has been another pinch point in the economy. The complex dance between ships, ports, trucks and railroads has struggled to keep up with the increased volumes. International shipping companies reported the highest profits in a decade as rates to ship goods from Asia to the rest of the world skyrocketed. The weather was very different across the country. The east and southeast saw above average moisture as eight tropical storms and hurricanes made landfall. Seventy billion dollars of damage made 2021 the fourth most expensive hurricane season on record. The western two-thirds of the country saw below average rainfall. Another winter with under average snowfall left western rivers and reservoirs with low water levels. Grazing in the west became more difficult while many ranchers reduced their herds as pasture quality declined. The long-term forecast holds difficult decisions for cattlemen. Drought conditions drove massive fires in the West throughout the year. 7.8 million acres burned in the United States, 
which is 5% above the 10-year average. Despite dry conditions through much of the corn and bean belt, the grain harvest was large. Both corn and soybeans delivered the second largest crops on record. The huge crops were met by high global demand, which supported high grain prices and strong local basis. Yet net farm profits were expected to decline compared to 2020, as multiple years of high government payments to commodity growers grew to a close. It was indeed a tumultuous year, 2021. Well, next week we have an encore presentation of one of our favorite stories, a positive story at that. You think New Orleans, you think seafood, right? That's where you'll find this family, experts in aquaculture over the years and the shrimp in business big time. In an industry that's competitive in every way, like land-based farmers, they're out early in the morning, bringing home the day's catch, still competing against foreign companies, still pursuing the American dream after half a century. Forrest Gump would be proud we're in Nolens next time on Farm Week. Before we go this week, I want to take a moment to say goodbye to a friend of mine. He wasn't a farmer. He didn't have anything to do with agriculture. But Les Shapiro was a giant in the world of television, and he was truly an outstanding human being. I worked with Les in Denver back in the 90s. He was one of those rare professionals that no matter how busy he was, he always had time for you. Les covered everything there was to cover in sports, and he also found time to give back to the community. A few days ago, Les lost his struggle with lung, lung cancer, he passed away, surrounded by the family he loved so much. On Facebook, last Saturday, this message from his family. Les passed away this afternoon. It could not have gone much better. He was at home, and the immediate family was all there. We spent the last four days with him, joking around, telling stories, and reading him the messages you all sent. We can't imagine someone feeling more loved at the end of life than Les did. Thank you all. My friend Les Shapiro was 65.